I have major writer's block, which is aided and abetted by my meds currently making it feel like my brain is just two semi-trucks crashing into one another, so we're going to go back to my old faithful, or old faithfuls, as it were. Since my current brain chemistry can't be trusted to make a reasonable decision on its own, I'm gonna let fate decide. Heads, it's Minecraft, and tails, it is Fallout. And it's Minecraft. Let's do this! Dear Mojang, hi, it's me! Austin! I wrote this part all in caps, which means I gotta scream it, right? Oh boy, my brain is not okay! But I'm here, I'm rearing the go, and I gotta say, Mojang, the weather in Minecraft makes no goddamn sense. <laughs> I first came upon this topic probably a million years ago, but most recently it was when I was starting another Minecraft game for what must be the 100th time. My goal this time around was to be as sustainable as possible. That means I wanted to only use resources that were renewable, like wood, trees, farming, breeding livestock, stuff like that. And I immediately failed this goal when I realized I needed cobblestone for an oven and then mined a few stone. Then of course I stumbled across a town and realized I could steal an oven and a bed from one of the huts and so I I did that instead. Then I cleaned them the hell out of everything they owned and scraped together enough iron to make the holy grail of tools in Minecraft. The humble bucket. Since I was in a snowy biome, all the water in the area was frozen and I needed to melt it in order to properly grow the crops I stole from the nearby village. So I stole some nearby lava and bada bing bada boom, you got water. Which means I got crops, which means I got potatoes. And then suddenly... It began to snow. Beautiful, fluffy snowflakes falling from the sky. Nothing like some cold thoughts running through my imagination while the baking 90 degree heat boils me from the inside out. Fun fact, my air conditioner died when it was 92 degrees outside, so that was fun. But then, ah, what do I see off in the distance? Some plains! Grassy fields, rolling hills, beautiful pastures. But what was it missing? Snow! I had to check for myself in person, but nope! It was raining. Snow, rain, 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 this weather, frankly, is impossible. Yes, impossible. This video game mechanic here, this video game thingy, this fake thing that we all know is fake and for fun is totally and completely impossible and is driving me up the wall. Whew, okay. Deep breaths here. I'm calm. Are you calm? We're all calm here. All right. Calmly, let's talk about why Minecraft worlds make no sense in the slightest. But first, we have to talk about biomes and how they are generated. Biomes. What is a biome? Well, I've talked about it before, but let's talk about it again since this is the topic du jour this time. To bring everyone up to speed, in Minecraft there are these fascinating features called biomes. Biomes represent distinct areas within the game that possess their own unique environmental characteristics, including temperature, plant life, animal species, trees, and weather patterns. Even if you weren't aware of the term biomes, you have likely encountered them in the form of deserts, plains, oceans, mountains, mushroom fields, swamps, and the frozen landscapes. In the real world, a biome is easy enormous, encapsulating thousands of square kilometers of space, but in Minecraft they are teeny tiny, even if you have the large biomes feature ticked on. The generation of biomes in Minecraft involves a captivating combination of techniques. This includes utilizing Perl and noise functions, progressive scaling algorithms, and other methods to determine the ratio of landmass to ocean, creating temperature clusters, and assigning biomes that meet specific criteria within these clusters through weighted randomness. As a result, the game intentionally avoids putting extremely cold areas right next to scorching desert regions, ensuring a more realistic and immersive experience. That said, it's not perfect by any means. Using some simple Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I was able to triangulate from this map and figure out that my snowy biome here, where I'm started at, is only 1.274 kilometers away from a jungle, and yet 1.810 kilometers away from a sweltering desert. This is problematic! The only instances where you see this in our world is tall, tall mountains next to deserts, and the only reason the mountains have snow on them at all is because they're like a bazillion feet up in the air, where the air is so much colder than it is at sea level. And even this can cause problems, like rain shadows, which is often what creates the deserts in the first place. You see, when moist air in the form of wind encounters a mountain, it is pushed up toward the top of the peak as it tries to get over the mountaintop. As the air gets colder due to elevation, it condenses and forms either rain or snow, which falls mostly on one side of the mountain. Then, the air 
air finally makes it over the mountaintop, but it's no longer moist. It's actually quite dry, which creates desolate, dry areas on the sides of some mountains. The most famous example being the Tibetan Plateau, which is... You guessed it, in Tibet, although it does cross into China as well. Now, before we talk about pressure, let's take a break from the pressures of life and YouTubing to talk about today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. I haven't gotten over my starstruckedness from the last time Brilliant sponsored me, because Brilliant.org is a crazy good fit for the videos I make, and I think for those of you who like to watch my videos. If you watch my videos, you likely want to learn new things and learn to think in new and interesting ways, and that's what Brilliant is all about. Brilliant's not just another platform filled with boring lessons that tell you learning stuff is about memorizing useless, forgettable facts. Instead, Brilliant teaches you how to think about math and science in an intuitive way. They do this by training you to develop steady learning habits, not by slamming an overwhelming amount of information in your head, but rather by using a series of advanced, low-pressure problems and examples that pretty much anybody can understand. If you remember from last time, I'm very bad at calculus, so I started the pre-calc course on Brilliant. Right now, I'm working on ellipses, and I cannot get over how fun and interesting the toys that Brilliant gives you are. Their intuitive, interactive tools literally make you get a grasp for how different principles work, like the distances of different focuses from one another based on eccentricity and denominators. If you want to be smarter than you already are and want to make it easy, you can head on over to brilliant.org slash shoddycast to get started. That link not only gets you 20% off for an entire year, but gets you 30 days of Brilliant to try for free to see if you like it. Now where was I? Oh right, pressure. Okay, let's talk about air pressure. Here's some air. This air exerts pressure on everything around it because gravity is pulling it down towards the ground, kind of like how you exert pressure on your toilet seat while you sit there watching this video. It's because gravity is pulling you down into the toilet seat. If there was no gravity, there'd be no pressure. The air and you would simply just float away. And now at these temperatures, air looks like this, and the heat energy in them, which is essentially just kinetic energy stored in the molecules as tiny vibration, causes these molecules to bump into each other. As they bump into each other, they fly apart. Part. The more heat they have, the more they vibrate, and the more they hit each other, and the more they fling apart. So, they get further apart. As a result, there's actually less air in any given space when the air is hotter than it would be otherwise. It's not enough to impede your breathing or anything like that, but it's enough to create what's called pressure differentials, which was just what it says on the tin. Differences in pressure. We will get to that part in a bit, but here's the best part. Because the air is lighter, there's less of it pressing down on the ground and the air around it. Meaning, hot air has lower pressure than air at lower temperatures. And what happens when you cool the air down then? Well, the molecules, molecules, that's not right. Are they dating each other? All <laughs> Well, the particles are moving less quickly, are less likely to bump into each other, and bada bing, bada boom, as a result, they get closer together, like so. I mean, maybe they are a polycule. What else does that mean? They get what? Denser. So if hot air is less dense and as a result has less pressure, what does that mean about cold air? What this actually means is that cold air is heavier, denser, and exerts, as a result, more pressure on the ground, on the air around it, everywhere. It also tends to sink closer to the ground, at least compared to hot air, since it is heavier by volume. All right, so there's another property you gotta know about air, or rather, temperature, but this affects the air too. It seeks equilibrium. If you put a cold thing on a hot thing, heat will leave the hot thing and go into the cold thing until they are both the same temperature. It's like putting a piece of ice in a skillet, except the same temperature here is hotter than water's vaporization point and it turns to steam. And ignore my dirty stove if it's dirty. I have no idea if it's dirty right now. I just... You know, I actually cook stuff in my kitchen and it gets dirty. Anyway, this is what's known as equilibrium, but it works differently with air because you're not talking about an equilibrium of temperature, but an equilibrium of pressure. Here is a crude, and I mean very crude, pressure map of my Minecraft world, with red being places of high pressure and blue being places of low pressure. High pressure areas really, really want to rush into low pressure areas. It's like why canned air wants to shoot out. The high pressure gas in the can wants to exit the premises 
is to fill the space of the lower pressure ambient air. And here's where things get cataclysmic. Because extreme high pressure is so close to extreme low pressure, the results would be apocalyptic. These high pressure cold areas immediately upon being created by the world generator would rush into the low pressure hot areas less than two kilometers away. We're talking wind gusts of up to 200, 300 miles per hour, ripping trees from their roots and sending them flying like miniature javelins. In areas like this, where a low pressure area is surrounded by multiple high pressure zones, the air would collide and swirl together to form tornadoes unlike the world has ever seen. Possibly vertical ones, since Minecraft is flat and lacks normal centripetal force, it'd be like a bomb of air was let off in these low pressure zones, getting hit by all sides by flying trees and debris, villagers getting ripped apart by eddies. It'd be madness, chaos, catastrophe. And then calm serenity. Eventually, these high pressure and low pressure zones would equalize, find equilibrium, and eventually everything would be calm. And life would, uh, find a way to survive the initial onslaught of hellacious weather. But do not doubt me. Every single Minecraft world would be erupting with the force of several nuclear warheads upon creation as biomes across the entire map exploded into each other with the force of a sledgehammer. But a sledgehammer made out of wind. It's totally unrealistic. Bam! Suck on that square block sort of Lego game about building stuff. You are totally unlike reality. <laughs> <laughs> I have done it again! Sincerely, Austin. Wow, that video was exhausting to record. You like Screamy Austin because he's back, baby! Oh my god, and he's tired after that. He's gonna have to take a nap. But before I take a nap, I have to thank my Patreon patrons who make this show possible. And if you want to be a Patreon patron, you can head on over to patreon.com slash shoddycast or patreon.com slash thescienceyt and contribute whatever you can. Any amount is helpful, seriously. And if you want this show to keep continuing, please go over to Patreon and be like these fine people who paid me extra money to say their names at the end of videos. I'm talking about M. Lopez, Dr. Vem, Ronald Coleman, Alan Hagers, Edit MTP, Marissa Resnick, Nick Patterson, and Loretta Mazer. If you guys are the real ones, and I will see you when I'm done doing Markiplier impersonations. Okay, bye!